So welcome, welcome guys to another presentation video. I had a big response from you all. You all seem to really like the uh, format. I thought I'd do another one on another topic that's been on my mind. So if you missed it earlier in the week, I did a video called What About Living World Season 6? And we talked about all the ways in which that could be implemented. What was really on my mind is how can we explore more of Tyria and get more detail out of those areas of Tyria because the adventure is really the big thing that I care about in the game. And I wasn't quite sure how Season 6 like will work or if they'll even do a season six or how that will segue into a future expansion and I kind of wanted to take a, a long view that refers back to all the previous eras of Guild Wars and how they might go about it. We of course have absolutely no idea but that's really what the, the video was about. So in my season six video I had a very brief little moment where I talked about the super adventure box and I talked about living world season one and I said okay look I've got all these cool ideas but here are two massive things Guild Wars could really use and based on my ideas here there's no space for them there's nowhere to put them in so I kind of said to you guys what do you think about this how would it go and I got a lot of comments from you a couple of nights uh, ago as well I put up a Twitter poll and I put up a YouTube poll, uh, kind of polling you guys to figure out which you would rather, Living World Season 1 or the Super Adventure Box. And interestingly enough, most of you guys said, and here I've actually got some screenshots for us, uh, you guys said Living World Season 1. So I said you only get one pick on Twitter and we had a 59% response to 41%. There was only 24 hours to vote on that. Um, but that was, you know, 2,500 people voting there, and then on YouTube, I had nearly 5,000 people voting, and the response was much stronger for Living World Season 1 there. My guess is that my specific YouTube audience, we're much more into story, uh, people who are watching me specifically here and include on that level, I think we're all kind of longer term fans, or largely many of us are. So we kind of see the value and the strength of that, um, you know, uh, being a big thing for the game. I think I have a lot of other people in a more sort of normal sampling of the Guild Wars community over on Twitter, where there is a little bit less, but I mean, that's just 60% people want Season 1. Now here's the funny thing about Season 1, and that's what I want to dedicate this video to, therefore. S Super Adventure Box is a great other topic as well. And considering we're moving into April, maybe we can look at that soon. But what I wanted to uh, pose is the question, how do we do Season 1 then? And so since I had no answer for that before, I've had a real stop and a, a think and a sit down of how I would go about it. And uh, we'll just see where we end up. So this is basically kind of like a fan fiction, all right? Um, as I'm saying here, don't be too mad at me here. If you don't like the idea of like a fan fiction, how Season 1 would come in, <laughs> don't watch this at all, okay? Um, but I think there is an interesting question, especially because what the audience would prefer is Living World Season 1, and, um, it's the bigger of the two things. Undoubtedly, the remainder of the Super Adventure Box, just two episodes, would be far more simple. In a way, it would be best for these responses to be flipped, but we all know the truth, that Season 1 is more important, right? Or at least I think we do, so... I do want to pose this question here. I had a lot of comments from people in that debate, Season 1 or Super Adventure Box, of people taking the side of the Super Adventure Box and saying, no, Season 1's actually a bad idea. And the reason I actually polled that is because I didn't really know what my answer to the question was. Because in a lot of ways, I do think Season 1 could be the negative choice. So let's actually justify it. Are the people right to want Season 1? So, here are my arguments for it. First and foremost, as I mentioned in my Season 6 video, this is all about new fans for me. Really, more than anything else, it's about fresh blood. It's about the anecdote I gave you the other day where I was able to get into Final Fantasy just as long of an MMO, but I was able to play the whole thing and get into the story. You can't do that with Guild Wars easily. Half of that is because of the gem gates, which is another topic, right? Um, but if there's a missing chunk of the story, it's so clunky and weird to have new players come in, finish all the personal story with its side-by-side -side cutscenes and its emphasis on personal decision making, and then move into a totally different format of storytelling without those side-by-side -side cutscenes, and that now has a totally new cast and just feels really, really janky. And I want to note as well, you know, the idea that there's a missing chapter is bad enough, but it's not just that it's a missing chapter, it's that this is a really important chapter of the game. This season one chapter is the introduction of the most important members of the cast for the past half decade. Longer than that, the past six, seven years of Guild Wars 2 has been about these Dragon's Watch characters and they're introduced in season one. You know, it would be different if we were still dealing with Logan, Ritlock, Zodja, Air, the whole crew, right? 
Because at least they're introduced in the personal story and people get that. It wouldn't feel so janky. But this is the introduction to the main characters, which is just like this double tragedy that we're in here. As I explained in my End of Dragons review, at the end of End of Dragons, they haven't changed that status quo in any way. It looks like we're still happy to be around these members of Dragon's Watch. Some of them have good introductions, right? Like Blish and Gor- uh, not Blish, Gorik specifically, at least has a real introduction in Season 4. But with many of them, we're kind of looking at stuff that people can't play. And while ArenaNet were happy to rush us out of the end of, uh, Elder Dragon stuff, we're out of all of that baggage. These characters are still here. You know, we're going to be like the Scooby-Doo Mystery Gang. Um, Mystery Inc., what are they called? Um, you know, and we might have some new people from End of Dragons, like Detective Rama. But at the end of the day, this is a crucial part of that story. Now, another thing we could look at is the arguments, why not? So, I had a lot of messages. Over the years, I've had this debate. And basically, there are two big arguments that I think have to be addressed. First of all, what do you... If you're going to actually put Season 1 in the game, what do you say to people who have already played it, you know? There's going to be a lot of people out there, hopefully watching this video, they haven't been alienated already by it, um, who are looking at this and thinking, I, I already played Season 1. I don't want Season 1, I want new stories because I've already experienced that. Uh, and I think that's a really strong argument. The one thing I would respond to that, and I, I do want people to pay attention to it, is that you may have played Season 1, but let's face it, it was 7, 8 years ago now. So when we're, when we're, you know, for a lot of this, I'm looking at new fans, right, who never got to play it. But what about the people who are there? And I do think that Guild Wars has a, a good audience of people who are still around from those old days. After all those years, do you really think you remember all of Season 1 perfectly? Now, I'm someone who talks about the Season 1 story a lot. I've looked at those old release pages. I've done, like, you know, lore video. That, that I did a big project just last year, I think it was. Maybe it was slightly over a year ago where I did a whole video running all the way through season one. I, like, covered this game for a living during that time, and I played every little bit I could, and I tried to focus on it, and I, I did videos about it back then. And even I, every time I go back to looking at details about season one, I think to myself, oh, yeah, there was that detail. I forgot about that. Oh, I forgot about that. Or I get nostalgic about things, and I think, oh, yeah, that wasn't there. Now, I'm guessing the vast majority of other people are not as invested in remembering that information as I am. So imagine the amount of information that you might have forgotten. Imagine the amount of extra joy and detail there that is just totally lost and you could indeed be nostalgic about. So I would say there's actually a lot of value for people there. And that's assuming, by the way, that you were all super hardcore throughout Season 1 and you played every patch. A lot of people didn't. In fact, this was one of the big problems of Season 1 back then. That it was such rapid releases and they were getting deleted. It was fear of missing out. Most people I talk to, like real players, they'll say, oh, I played the start, but then I didn't play the other bits. Or, oh, I missed this patch in the middle. I missed that patch in the middle. It was splotchy. The idea of getting Season 1 back is the whole thing. There will be new fresh value. I don't buy the argument that everyone has picture perfect insane savant level memory about something that came into the game eight years ago. There is another argument though and that's the well so what I might have some new gameplay experiences or it might feel fresh but at the end of the day I know the story. I know the plot. Um, and exactly where it's going. I'd rather do new stuff so that we can really be thrown all over the place by the studio and we could see any kind of number of things happening with Tyria. I know that season one is going to end with Scarlet waking up Morgamoth. And to that, I don't really have an answer at all. I think we have to acknowledge that argument and we have to say that if season one's going to be done, it is going to be treading old ground and there's no way around that. Now, I think that there are things they can do on a small scale, which I'll get to in a second, but I do want to acknowledge that. I also want to note as well, by the way, this whole idea of adding Living World Season 1 that is so good for new fans and stuff, it is pointless. I don't think I could ever really endorse Living World Season 1 as like a big initiative, ever. I just don't think I could do it if we're still in a world with gem gates. They are the same issue. The point here is that players can make a new character in Guild Wars 2, whether you're a pre-existing fan or a new one, and you can play through from the start to the end and become invested in these characters, become invested in Tyria. And you can't do that right now because there's a chapter missing, but you also can't realistically do it because of the gem gates. Don't ask people to buy the ultimate edition of the game and then spend all those gems on gem gates so they don't even get any value out of them and even when they do that they still don't have full access to the releases don't ask people to grind for that gold it's pointless so what if season one comes in if people are still having to spend all these gems they will be alienated we need to be in this position where word of mouth about guild wars is 
You know, I'm on rmmorpg.com or whatever. Uh, not .com. I'm on rmmorpg on Reddit, right? And someone says, oh, I'm interested in Guild Wars. Is it worth it? People can honestly and sincerely just say, yeah, just play it. I don't want to, this spiral into some massive conversation about gem gates and all the grind they're going to have to do and ultimate additions and so on. It sucks. If they're not removing the gem gates, there's no point in this. There's no point. It's a waste of time. So I will say that. And another thing as well, I think, is you kind of have to look at the Zaitan story too, to a certain degree. And the personal story, which is delivered in a very different way. I think that season one only really works for new pla new fans. If new fans are also being incentivized to get through the whole personal story. The personal story is very long and it can feel very tedious. And it doesn't have a lot of those presentation benefits. And it doesn't even have a great carrot for finishing it, right? There's like a packed weapon you get at the end and some mentor kits. I think that if they add some better reward to actually beating the personal story... That then segues people into season one and there's no gem gates. We would be in a really good position for word of mouth. And this would actually start working like it should. And people would play through. But right now we're in a weird place where half the new players are getting recommended to level 80 boost. And nobody really believes in Zaitan and all that kind of stuff. So I think that kind of sucks. So I would, I would actually pair this not only with the removal of gem gates. But a little something. Something. To get people invested in even the personal story too. Because, I mean, what are we doing? We're trading one moment for another otherwise, right? Where we have a clunky moment jumping in at the start of Season 1 because that's what people recommend because the personal story isn't recommended still. So I'd look at that too. These two things I think are crucial. And I, if we're not doing those, it's not worth the, the development time. So let's move on. Um, there's a big question on my mind. Let, let's, say, let's say we've convinced people that this should actually happen now. And I appreciate some people are unconvincible. Uh, how long do they spend on it? So this is where it starts to get really fun. Let's remind ourselves, the real season one took two full years of development. All right, it ran from 2012 to 2014, basically. Now, the South Sun patch and the first, you know, stuff at uh, Halloween when the lighthouse got affected for the first time and the stuff I think it was, or the statue... Um, you know, and, and the introduction of fractals and the consortium with them and stuff. That technically wasn't being called Living World at the time. It technically wasn't what you'd think of as Living World Season 1. We think of the start as Flame and Frost. But that all folds into the story, right? And so, um, if you really look at it, it's like 2012. The back half of 2012, after the game came out. Right up till 2014 when Season 2 started. That's two years. So, what are we going to say? We're going to do two years again? We're going to copy paste each of those releases in the same order. No, that that's crazy. That's totally unrealistic. And I wouldn't argue for that. So I think what we're actually looking at, I mean, just imagine that. Imagine that, that we spent two years now on Living World Season 1. <laughs> Where is the time for the Canther stories? Surely we want another expansion at that point. And people like Canther, right? So I don't think that that's realistic. I think we have to go smaller. And so now we're in a really interesting place where we're talking about two years of development in the past being condensed into some smaller fraction. Now that might be viable because they can reuse the art assets and all that kind of stuff, but it's still going to be tricky. What is the right way to do it? Now, one proposal I like is to actually mix the releases in together. You could do a season one episode and then a canther episode and then a season one episode and then a canther episode. But I'm a little concerned about how um, trying to like strike a balance here. It's just going to muddy the waters and confuse things. Maybe it's possible. It's not the main thing I like. Another idea that's quite cool is to do all of Season 1 in just a single episode. Now, what is currently in the game is we have a recap that takes about 10 minutes to do. And it's just a giant lore dump and a mini cutscene. And I applaud the effort and the initiative and the idea from the studio. But this idea of it being a recap, not the actual game, is kind of a fundamental thing, I think. So if they were to do all of Season 1 in a single episode, like, say summer this year is dedicated to season one and then we move on i don't think they can realistically have us play the whole thing can they in one episode it's just not going to be right it's going to still feel like a recap it's still going to be phrased and framed in that way and if they're doing that i think it's still going to feel weird it's still going to we're still going to be in a place in the community where people lament the loss of the original season one and they say i want to play the original season one i think if this project is going to happen it has to be in such a way that no one ever feels bad ever again about missing the old stuff and they will feel bad if it's ever if it just feels like a recap even if it's a really lengthy decent recap 
an enhanced version of what's currently in the game that comes in in one episode. So I don't really believe in that proposal either. So, okay, so we're talking about doing season one, but spending like more than one release. Two years is too much. What about one year? Well, I think even a whole year is a bad idea. I think a whole year to actually sit down and tell people, okay, you're not going to get an expansion for a year. We just lived through that, kind of, with nothing happening after the end of the Icebridge Saga. So doing that now is an especially volatile proposition. But at any point in the game, whether you're delaying Living World Season 6, Living World Season 7, whatever plans they have, I really don't think a whole year is the right way to go. But one episode is too short, so here's what I would say. Um, I think three episodes. I think I'd spend three episodes on this. And I don't know whether that's totally right. But what I'm thinking is based on how season three and four did things. So if, did you see my What About Living World season six video? I think if you did something like that, right, where it's like you have a strike mission in the release and you have, you know, all these various pieces there. Um, and it kind of feels like season three and four did where we get a release every three months and it's a big meaty release with a good story journal. I think you could get an actual, re realistic, real playthrough of Season 1 split across three patches. And what you would do then is that's the majority of the year. That is asking the community to wait nine months. Nine months before we get back to Canther or whatever. But I think it's doable. And I think that that's, not, that's on the edge. And that's like saying, okay, but look, you do have these great releases. You may know how they end, right? To go back to the previous slide. Uh, you, you may have memories of it before, but it is only nine months. So that's kind of the balance I think I would aim for. It's, it's tough, though. It's tricky. I'm not saying I have a real answer on this, but it's tough. Next, um, there's another big question. When should they do it? So it's funny, 20 minutes before recording this, I was looking at my YouTube comments and I saw someone literally said, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to feel about the Guild Wars' story after the last mission. Is Guild Wars 2 ending? So this is a tricky question. There are two proposals. Do you do it now or do you do it later, right? So let's go over the arguments for doing it um, later, okay? 2023 or beyond. So I think it's a good idea to do it later because right now the story has like slammed stop. We're full breaks. We have no cliffhanger in the game right now. We have no suggestion of any expansion right now. We don't even have any Guild Wars 1 lore to, like, excite people. You know, for years in Guild Wars 2, it's been like, Oh, I can't wait to go to Cantha. Oh, I can't wait to go to Alona. Oh, I can't wait to go to the Maguma jungle. Okay, fine. I don't think people were really asking for that. But we didn't really have much old lore. The Fire Island chain, maybe, once upon a time, was something we wanted. There's nothing now. There's basically no hook. There's maybe Zotaker. That's it. And that, to me, makes it feel like this is a really bad time to do Season 1. Because nobody knows what's happening with Guild Wars. People are wondering, is Guild Wars ending? And I, I'm scared of that. The other thing is that Cantha was really rich, right? There are mysteries in Cantha. I haven't done my, like, lore videos on those yet. You will see those. Um, there's some hooks about the future. People are looking at Arborstone. They're looking at, you know, I, I guess I'll try to be spoiler-free here. But people like Cantha and they want stuff in Cantha. And, and so season one right now, that seems like a terrible idea. Okay, so those are my arguments for later, 2023 or beyond. There are some arguments for right now. And so the top one, I think, is that, look, for seven years, guys, season one ended in 2014. All right. Eight years ago. Not even seven years. Eight years ago. Eight years. What has happened to my life, man? Eight years, right? And for all eight years, what have they been saying? What's the community been saying? What's the studio been saying to itself? Ah, we'll do it later. We'll do it later. We'll do it later. We'll do it tomorrow. It's better later. It's better later. It's better later. For eight years, we've been doing that. So we can sit here today and say it's better later again. But later will never come. At some point, you have to do it. So it's been put off long enough already. And they just have to rip off the band-aid at some point. So maybe they do it now. You could also argue that the fact that the story has come full stop now is actually precisely why it's a good time right now. Because we don't have a cliffhanger. Because we're not interrupting anything else that people are especially interested in. I mean, there are things out there, but there are a lot of people like Joe Mama up here who kind of, they, they don't know where it's going. So now it's like the breathing room is here. So you could take that argument. I, I don't know if I'm conv fully convinced by that, but I can see why other people might be and that might make it valid enough. 
You've also got the fact that End of Dragons just reminded us of Living World Season 1, which is one of the things I've applauded about End of Dragons so much. My Trin's in it in a big way, the Aether Blades are in it in a big way, even some earlier stuff. So, and you know, like little subtle references, maybe that is good enough reason than anything else. If they did Season 1 now, people might play it because it's like, hey, here's the origin story of My Trin, right? And here's what she was alluding to with Scarlet. Um, and, you know, some of the stuff that we saw in the Strike Mission. So there's that extra enthusiasm. And finally, um, another argument is, if you look at my Season 6 episode, I was talking about all these things I'd love to see in Season 6, but so often the slides were starting with me saying, but this needs system work. They've got to iron out dailies. They've got to iron out achievements. They've got to iron out, you know, the strike mission format. They've got to put fr uh, dungeons into fractals, and they've got to put the old raids into the strikes, and all that kind of stuff, right? There's a, and, and guild missions, and on and on and on. These are everything I said in that previous video. It was a 70 minute video, and I believe every little thing in it was like of absolute priority. But very often I was saying, look, there's got to be some back end work done, or, you know, front end work done. There's got to be some system stuff done. And, um,. And where's the time for that? So maybe season one is really good right now because it can double up while they're reusing all those old art assets and doing that while the teams are, you know, making story journal stuff. Other people are figuring out what Guild Wars looks like in terms of end game, in terms of release cadence and stuff like that. And they can use that nine months, as I've proposed, to actually hammer that stuff out so that when season six hits, it can be the glorious season six we all dreamed of. Whatever version that is for you guys. I, I talked about what mine is, but, you know, whatever theirs is. So that's an argument too. They can double up that time on season one with uh, figuring out season six. Maybe. So what one do we pick? I don't know. I've kind of convinced myself as I was scripting this out of the second now. So I don't know. I think I prefer doing it later. I'm really worried about Joe Mama. <laughs> Uh, who who doesn't know what Guild Wars story is and I'm really scared that just going back to season one is just too much on the breaks Maybe they can complement it by mixing in and out with some current events and stuff But you know what I really like the idea of I like the idea of doing season six right here right now and then season one and Season one is complemented by expansion press like if you think about it 2021 the year we just lived through that was the perfect year for season one, right? Because we would have people excited about End of Dragons and like End of Dragons press and where the story's ultimately going. But then you also have season one to sort of keep your attention in the meantime. And then when you're playing against my Trin and stuff in this expansion, it all would have made sense. 2021 was perfect for this. Perfect last year. But obviously there was COVID and there was all the other mess, so it never happened. So I don't know, maybe... Maybe now, maybe later, I can't decide, but I think season six first is, is the best choice, really. And then balance season one with expansion stuff. All right, so the next big question is how should it be done? So we've said why, we've said when, we've asked a lot of questions. How do you do it? So first things first, the story journal is essential. Do I even need to say this out loud? A clear, real, like proper season that you link into right after Zaitan dies and you link out of into season two. It's all there in the journal. It's linear. New players don't get lost. It's not going to a random fractal and then going to a scrying pool instance and then going to, you know, the marionette mini thing. This is pointless if it's not all a clear path through. Now, uh, here's the thing. This is where things get really fun and tricky. Season one's really complicated in, in, in a lot of ways. First of all, we have the simple fact that I'm proposing two years worth of development, something like 20 major releases, maybe not as high as 20. 15 to 20, I don't know what the number is, but we're talking about taking lots of releases and putting them to like three, right? Or one with one of the other proposals or, or, or slightly more. That's, that's gonna be a hell of a challenge. But beyond that as well, season one doesn't exist like we currently look at the story journal. It was full of story in patch notes and mails and open world Zerg content. There's a certain quality to the original season one that you just can't recapture. Like how every few weeks in real life, people would notice more and more trees were getting chopped down in, K in Kessex Hills. And then eventually that became the Tower of Nightmares. Like how do you do that in the story journal? That, that was like... Season one relied on the passage of real time and word of mouth between players. That doesn't work 
as far as we now think of Guild Wars story releases. There weren't green starbursts pointing you from A to B to C. There were yellow markers and like subtle suggestions of new events appearing. Season 1 doesn't exist as many of you guys might think it did. There's nothing to copy paste for the devs. There's no magic switch to flip and something coherent will exist. You know, I doubt they even have like some of the old data stuff of previous builds of the game. Like it, it's not there. So I would say they shouldn't even try to make Season 1 feel like it once did. I would treat it as totally new Living World development as per the Living World Season 3 and 4 thing. I would assign teams like they did, you know, during the POF and the Heart of Thorns era. And yes, they get to double dip and reuse a bunch of old art assets and stuff. That's good. And some of the vo old voice acting's there. But I'm literally talking about making totally fresh new Living World here. It's just that it's about the Living World Season 1 story. Now, why this is a real benefit, first of all, there's basically no other way to do it, as far as I can see. But this is a really good uh, benefit because it addresses some of those arguments I had a second ago. People will say, I've played it already. Well, you haven't, because this is new. This is a totally new constructed thing. It's just based on and themed around that old story. And what it also does is it allows them to leverage all their new tools and expertise that we saw they've developed in recent years through Season 4, through the Ice Brood Saga with those amazing cutscenes with Bangar and stuff, and End of Dragons. I mean, we all just played End of Dragons, right? Whether you like the story direction or not, I think we can all agree that the presentation of End of Dragons is astoundingly good. And so, they could leverage all of those new tools and put them into Living World Season 1. Now think about that. If this is a project that's happening to convince new players to get into Guild Wars 2 story, think about it. Yeah, you're going through the personal story. It's a little bit shoddy. They can up it a bit, as I've proposed here. But then you hit Season 1, and Season 1's like End of Dragons quality. Season 1's like Season 4 quality. It's amazing! And that would really convince all these people. Okay, this is cool. And then there's a bit of a step back in Season 2. Fine, but it's plotted well. And then you're in an expansion with Hearthorns. So this could be really cool. The fact that they could leverage all this new stuff they're doing with the camera work and so on. New cutscenes that are like, you know, have all the mocap and sort of the lip sync and stuff we've seen like End of Dragons had. That really excites me. So that's the approach I would have to do something totally new. Now, here's the thing. If we're taking that approach... And considering that a one-for-one -one replication is basically impossible anyway, I would go one step further at the outset, and I would, I would, I would be clear about something like maybe co controversial. Oh, we have a typo here. I didn't type a P in the word improve. I would give the teams that are making this like creative freedom to actually enhance, to add, or take away from the story in minor ways, and I would declare to everyone. That the new living world season one, the new one that's coming in, is the living world season one. Essentially, what I'm saying here, if you read between the lines, and this will be controversial to use the word, uh, but I'm saying like a clean slate from the old season one law. I'm talking about a retcon, basically. I'm saying get rid of, don't look at the old flimsily implemented stuff that no one's played in eight years and is impossible to come back. Let's eliminate that law. Now, Guild Wars has never really had a hardline stance of a moment where it eliminates old stuff, but I really do believe in that. If, if this project ends up going along this way, I would be very clear about that, and I would say, look, this is the season, not the old season. And that's because I don't want to be in some crappy position. Like, I can see it now, where a line of dialogue existed in the old season one, but it doesn't exist in the new season one. And now people are arguing about whether they contradict each other or whether it matters and stuff. I would say none of the old stuff matters anymore. You can't play it anyway, and they can't add it anyway, unless we're going... Unless we're going to do two full years again, and every release is exactly as it used to be. There's going to be these weird little discrepancies. Now, don't get me wrong, please. I, I want to be clear. I would want the new Season 1 to conform to previous lore as perfectly as it can, right? I would want it to work as smoothly and cleanly. But these little moments are going to happen. So just accept that they're going to happen. Wipe the old stuff off the slate. And if you're going to wipe things off the slate, take the opportunities to maybe enhance things a little bit every now and then. So, like, maybe... um. Oh god, I mean, this is where we're going to get really, uh, really fan fiction -y. But maybe have a little bit more of a moment where Air talks about Bram, right? So that some of those moments late with Heart of Thorns pay off a bit bigger. Maybe we can see a bit more of my trin. A lot of people who just played End of Dragons, they might have the impression that my trin had a bunch of story development season one. She didn't! She had hardly anything. So maybe they can just thicken it a little bit, you know? And a little bit of what Scarlet had planned her to do in the mists. You know, if you're going to be in this position anyway, where it's going to be different... 
Take that opportunity. Have Marjorie talk about some of their other sisters, maybe. Uh, a, a new scene in the Dead End Bar. And that those extra creative possibilities, I think, can improve Season 1. Um, but it does kind of mean this thing. I think we should go for a clean slate. That's what I'd argue. I'm prepared for a lot of people to be mad at me about that. But there you go. So. What will each con uh, release contain? What should they be? So I'm proposing these are full episodes. That's how I'd do it. And what, what would I say? Well, story journal, obviously. And I'm going to try not to slip too much into fan fiction stuff here, guys. I kind of wonder about system stuff like I did in the previous video. I think, obviously, a story journal. And they actually have a huge amount of ground to cover. You know, each story journal release is going to feel big. And I'll demonstrate that in a second. But, you know, we're trying to get the season one story in there with minimal cuts. I would also say that each release should have an associated open world map, just like we saw in season three and four. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying to make a bunch of new maps, all right? Um, but maps can get improvements, and uh, that will be clear in a second. I think every release needs a strike mission, because just like I said in my season six episode, it doesn't matter whether we're dealing with season one or season six or season seven or whatever. The fact is, these patches need end game stuff for groups to play and feel sticky with. That's where Guild Wars has always missed out. So that would mean there can be some new strike missions. That could that would mean some of these season one bosses can be enhanced, which I think is quite fun. And actually, I think the Dragon Storm thing, you know, where you have a, a big world boss, but it's in its own instance that spins up every now and then. I think Dragon Storm is brilliant. I think that season one is full of moments that can do that. So I think every release should have at least one Dragon Storm instance. So I'm going to justify that now. And I think that this next bit of the video is going to be really fun. So let's fanfic up the three episodes. Ready, guys? So episode one, what's the story going to be for episode one? Well, it's going to be the consortium. And it's going to be the Lion's Arch uh, attack from the Karka. All that stuff, which is really where it kicked up. We're going to, we're going to go through that. And we're going to follow Ellen Keel to South Sun Cove, right? That that stuff's there. That's basically how the season starts, with an attack on Lion's Arch. That's the beginning of the season. We then move straight in. We're still in the same patch. We're going to have the events of Flame and Frost. A little bit abbreviated in a bridge, right? You're not going to have, like, refugee camps spawning in the Black Citadel and Holbrack. But you're going to have the Flame and Frost stuff, which means we get a real introduction to Bram. We get a real introduction to Rox. These are kind of those initial characters, if you don't count the Kun the Canark stuff already having kicked up. Um, we have the Cragstead thing and the Hatchery thing. Not in a scrying pool, but the real instances. And, you know, propped up a bit. You know, I'm not talking about just copy-pasting the old ones. Which I think that the Icebrood Saga proved when they came in with the, <laughs> the scrying pool. They're actually pretty crappy. Uh, and then what we do is the uncut molten facility... That's obviously already re-implemented into Fractals in two separate islands. But there's actually a lot of sections of the Molten Facility that are not in Fractals. Seriously, like huge chunks of it. And it's really fun to see. So we get the original uncut one with the original dialogue, not Dessa stuff. And what I would say is when they do this, because there's going to be a, little a few little dungeon moments like this. They can look at DRMs and they can say, look, this is soloable now. You don't need a party. But it can scale to have a party. And you can even have, like, DRM replayability if you want. You know, DRMs. I was calling this kind of thing expeditions in my Season 6 video. Let's just ignore that. Because that's not a thing in Guild Wars. I'm just going to say, Molten Facility kind of working like a DRM would be awesome. And then we're going to end the patch with the return to South Sun. Um, which was a double release for the original Season 1 uh, Living World stuff. And Canark... Uh, we're going to meet Kazmir on the beach in the bikini, and she's going to be introduced there, but in kind of a minor way. Uh, that's what the story is, okay? So, this actually is a lot of content, I want to say. Um, but it, it kind of makes sense, you know? we kind of got two different things going on, and we've introduced a bunch of the characters immediately already. Now, I would, I would advise as well, and I think this is really important, of a new opening act to Season 1. Season 1's current opening act is really weird. I say current in air quotes. Like, you kind of had to be there for random updates and looking at, like, whales appearing on the beaches and consorting messages around Lion's Arch. None of that really works, you know? And following orange starbursts and fixing signs. None of that works anymore. So what I actually believe in, I'm not really going to ex uh, uh, um, suggest expansions to Season 1 that much because, obviously, there's so much to do anyway. But I really believe there needs to be an opener that has Destiny's Edge... Talking about where they're going and what they're doing. And explains why the commander isn't fully adventuring with them. That explains why we step away from Chahern and Fort Trinity for a bit. 
and sort of like gives us this freedom to now be looking and hanging around Lion's Arch. There has to be this moment because if there isn't this moment, well, what are we doing here, guys? We're just going to trade one clunky moment, which is the random start at the beginning of season two, for another clunky moment, which is like we're randomly not caring about the pact anymore and we're randomly not caring about Johan. There has to be a scene at the start that just like bridges that and smooths it. Where Traherne looks us in the eye and says, hey man, you know, there's a lot of logistical stuff going on here. Do you want to chill out and go hang out for a bit? I, I want it to feel smooth. Why are we trading one clunky moment for another? I acknowledge that this might be a little bit less clunky, but you know, come on, this is an opportunity here. So yeah, uh, I, w I really would like to see that right at the start. So anyway, that's what the story of this release would do. Okay, let's look at what the gameplay would do. So I would say the associated map is South Sun Cove, which obviously is already done. It's already there. But I think if they're going to add this in 2024, 2025, whatever, have bounties on it. Have races on it now. A new meta maybe, you know, enhance the map. Put some extra stuff in there to bring it up to that extra quality. Because South Sun Cove, let's, let's face it, is pretty barren. You can even look at like the car car activity. Now, season one had a ton of activities. This could maybe just become an adventure and get a real home in the game. Activities feel weird. So there, there's opportunities there. So that's what I would say that the associated map is South Sun Cove. Players are properly led there. You'll notice if you do a full story playthrough right now, you never go there at all. You, the Dragon Storm experience that I think should be a part of the release would be that big raid on South Sun Cove where we first go there with Ellen Keel. The Giant Season 1 event, if you originally played it, where everyone was getting precursors from the box at the end, that can come back as we watch the, um, the Lion Guards actually progress through and build the bridge and run through. We haven't played that for years. I think that could come back in the form of a Dragon Storm style experience. As I say, I call these expeditions, but whatever. And a uh, strike mission. I mean, come on. There's got to be a strike mission. I'd have it be the final boss, Kanak. Because it does end with a boss fight at, with Kanak. I mean, how many of you guys remember that? Listen, I just want to say to everyone watching this video who forgot that there's a massive boss sequence against Kanak in Season 1. That's exactly what I'm talking about. These kinds of details that you've forgotten about are why this is exciting, right? There's a lot in Season 1 you might have forgotten. Uh, so yeah, and then obviously uh, Ellen Keel burning everyone's contracts and stuff by sinking the ship out in the coast and Ellen Keel's got this moment. Having Ellen Keel in the story is going to be nice as well for that segue into the start of POF and stuff. So yeah, uh, Kanark and then Kanark CM a couple of weeks later. I'd love it, man. I like Kanark when he was an antagonist and he's it's been a long time since then. It'd be really interesting to play that and contrast him with like casino boss Kanark that we have now. So that's episode one. Episode two, here's my recommendation. What you got to realize about season one is for a good chunk of it, when it actually started to get going, they did double releases. Like they'd have a bunch of new assets and content and then two weeks later they'd expand on it a bit. And then we'd look at something new and then they'd expand on it and then we'd look at something new and there were double releases. So that's what episode two is. It's all the double releases. So we open with E and we get the mail from E. Now, if they were to do this in the near future, the E thing's quite interesting because then season six can look at E and the next expansion can look at E and we've all been reminded. But anyway, E's introduced. And anyway, we kick up with Dragon Bash. This is basically a really famous ma mail. This is the moment E was introduced with that mail there. And so I can imagine that getting that back would be cool. But this is Dragon Bash talking a bit about Zaitan's defeat. Theo Ashford would get assassinated and that whole conversation in End of Dragons, people would understand. Marjorie Delacroix's introduction here. Actually, she's one of the later characters, if you think about it, with the little cameo from Kazmir in the previous release. And so this double release was the Aether Blades. And just like before, when we had the Molten Facility, we get like a dungeon experience again here. But this is the Aether Blade Retreat. And I would say all the same things. Soloable. There's a bunch of content in there that you don't experience in Fractals, which would be really fun. This is the capture and the arrest of my Trin. Um, and yeah, if they do DRM style stuff so people can replay it, I think that would be absolutely fantastic, wouldn't it? It would be so cool. I really do believe in DRMs and new areas are awesome. And the Aether Blade Retreat and the Molten Facility are perfect for them. Um, so anyway, that's the first double release. That's the opening act. The assassination and my, my Trin's capture. Next, we go to do the, Aether, the Zephyrite stuff. The Zephyrites are really important um, because they had Aureen's egg. I mentioned in my Season 6 video that Aureen kind of was introduced in Season 2. It's not true. Aureen is introduced in Season 1, but she was an Easter egg in the distance. 
And it was actually technically the second Zephyrite arrival that you saw this. I would say you just have one moment with the Zephyrites arriving at the Labyrinthine Cliffs. And Aurene's egg is immediately clear there. Their connection to Glint is immediately clear. This is going to segue really nicely into Season 2 and into a Heart of Thorns, obviously. So, well, everything. Aurene is everything, right? So this is like, totally needs to be there. You know, I'd cut a ton of this other stuff before I'd cut this. Plus, the Labyrinthine Cliffs are awesome. I love the Bazaar of the Four Winds. Um, so anyway, that's the double release, and the next double release, we'd go straight to the Jubilee. It's gonna feel weird doing Dragon Bash at a festival into the Jubilee, another festival. In real life, there were a couple of months between these. So I don't know, maybe one of these gets cut, but I want it all because the Jubilee has Logan, it has Ritlock in it, it has Scarlet's proper introduction. So in episode one here, I would actually say, you know, you've got that hint about the city dweller, you know? And then, boom, we've got Scarlet is the city dweller here. Uh, finally, the last double release. So we're, we're doing all these double releases here um, with Twilight Arbor and the Tower of Nightmares. So Twilight Arbor is, you know, I think you just play through it a bit like the um, the Aether Blade Retreat. But we'd, we'd have a little bit of a look at Twilight Arbor. This is where this fits in with Kaith. There's actually a lot of regular Destiny's Edge stuff in this release, which is nice. And we have the climax of the Tower of Nightmares. Now, this is meaty. I can kind of see that this is actually two patches, right? But I don't want to spend a whole year on Living World Season 1. So I'm putting it all in one. Maybe some of this stuff gets cut. Maybe you split this in half. I can definitely buy that. But anyway, I don't know how I would do to Quartal Rising. This was just a world boss rework, but had rocks with the... Desire to get into Ritlock's warband story, but then Rox is kind of lame and doesn't have a great arc anyway And she's just gonna go off to the Omicron anyways. So, I don't know. I don't know how this fits in. We can have a little moment here I think Bram was a part of that too But yeah, so I'm a little bit iffy on this one interested in your comments on the YouTube video here And then for gameplay. Well, this is lots of fun, isn't it? We can associate a map with this release the Labyrinth and Cliffs. What do I mean by that? It's a full map now. How cool would this be? It's not just a festival map, it's that, you know, none of the other festivals, well, Super Adventure Box aside, like, lock a whole map off. This should be year-round now. They could connect it to Thunderheads, they could connect it to the Mount Maelstrom, so, like, all these things are connected together. Oh, expand on it a bit. Oh, I would love this so much. Year-round Labyrinth and Cliffs. And that would fit, that would be economical on the dev's end, and it would feel like a big meaty patch to have a map there, you know? For the strike, we've covered so much story stuff here that it could be a few things. The Toxic Prophet at the top of the Tower of Nightmares could be a strike mission. This would feel quite similar to the Fractal, though, that we already have, so maybe not. You could actually have Logan Ritlock encounter and a strike mission there. I actually think that the Pavilion is a great place to put a strike mission. We all have all these fond memories about soloing the bosses at the Pavilion and so on. So what if we have a strike mission that is like a boss rush, you know? It's like this boss and then another boss and then another boss and they're sort of all charging up. Uh, over us. It'd be quite cool. As for a big, like, Zerg Dragonstorm instance, I think you could do the time up the Clower- the- the climb up the Tower of Nightmares would be excellent. But there's also Scarlet's Playhouse, right? When Farron falls into the Nightmare version of the- the pavilion down there. And, um, I, I, how many people remember that? In fact, I- I really suggest you guys pause this video, go to YouTube, and look for footage of this. This was a crazy old instance. So maybe they could do that, I don't know. Or you'd cut it. But yeah, there's low, there's so much opportunity here for those uh, formats in Living World. I mean, maybe this really should be two episodes. Who knows? And then finally, we've got episode three. Now, what I've done here is I've had introduced Dragon's Watch in episode one, introduced Scarlet in episode two. And episode three is all about the conflict with Scarlet, essentially. So, and the final act, essentially, right? So season one started getting kind of weird at this point, And I think that the devs were getting burned out of the whole fear of missing out thing. And things were changing. I think it was around this time in real life. Um, I'd had a cool meeting with some of them. And they, they'd said that Morgimoth was going to wake up. So they were definitely leaving season one through these patches. So what have we got? Well, my train escapes the mists. This was in the original season one really easy to miss. I think it should be absolutely obvious that it happens this time. And maybe a bit of detail about what she's doing there. We could even have, uh, you know, some other characters from the future snuck in, you know, a little bit of Renyak or Ivan or something could be fun. Um, but yeah, the opener of this episode is the Scar studying Scarlet stuff. That's the marionette events and Timey's introduction. This is Timey getting into the story, last of all. We have um, the Thormanova stuff with the Fractal, right? You can actually, now they've already done a patch where you can see Anka in the Fractal, which is so cool. But that can be integrated 
that would actually feel really fitting. Um, and uh, and then of course studying her alliance idea below the Dermond Priory uh, base in the secret triple trouble. I don't think needs to have anything to do with this. We're obviously we've got the thumpers in the story now, but triple trouble doesn't have to be integrated in any level. It basically just works as it is in Blood Tide. Now there was a big thing in season one around this time that was like a huge part of Scarlet's character development, and this is one of the problems with season one. It was a short story on the website. And that is where we get Omad's machine, and that's where we get her mind breaking, and that's where we see her genius. It wasn't even in game or playable. So if they can find a way to get the short story in game and have people read it in game. Oh, that's so important for season one. Because here's the funny thing. Even assuming we did even assuming there was a magic button, even assuming there was a lever we could pull and just season one is back, exactly as it used to be, it would still be a crappy story. Because the short story is so important. And I believe you can get like fragments of it in season two. But the short story needs to be integrated somewhere. I'm not saying like have us play as Scarlet through all that. But it should be there. And then the episode. The majority of the episode is just the assault on Lion's Arch. Okay so. all the, That was like a triple release originally. The assault on Lion's Arch. The death of Scarlet. And Morgenmoth's awakening cutscene. Which is a really cool cutscene no one's seen for years. I think the current recap maybe has a little bit of it, but we could get the full thing in there. The lore video I did telling the story of Season 1, which you guys might be interested in watching, by the way. Um, uh, I think I integrated that whole cutscene into it. I did all the trailers and things. So, there you go. And just as I recommended for the start, it would be nice to get a little scene at the end. Where we just get a little bit of a reminder that the Zephyrites are there, because they're about to get shot down. The start of Season 2 is us w talking about the Zephyrites with our group. And the fact they've been shot down. So that cutscene, there's a trailer at the start of Season 2, which is the Zephyrites getting blown out of the sky. That trailer doesn't exist in game. I would integrate that as an in-game cutscene at the end. After Morgenmoth wakes up. That needs to be there. That wasn't in the original thing. Um, I, I would love it if we had like a post scene where we're in ruined Lion's Arch. Okay, so what you've what you've really focused on is how... These episodes, they start with an attack on LA and they end with an attack on LA. And Ruined Lion's Arch is like a whole third version of the city most people have forgotten about. I have a tour on my channel of it if you guys want to watch. Um, but it would be cool to be able to go back there. And just look, a little outro, essentially, that affirms these characters are going to adventure with us. And we're not with the pact, we're with these guys. And now you've got a great exit out of uh, the Zaitan stuff into Season 1 and a smooth move into Season 2. Where that mail from E makes sense, the people we're hanging out with makes sense. The Zephyrite disaster makes sense. All these things, are uh, Bram having been injured makes sense. All these things are very, very clunky. I can also, by the way, say that instead of uh, Ruined LA... The Dead End Bar is probably a great place to go. In real life, there was a mini patch that was like an epilogue at the Dead End Bar that immediately precedes Season 2, so they could redo that as well. And that would feel quite cool as well, considering they've used the Dead End Bar for the big proposal scene, the engagement um, at the end of End of Dragons. You might think I'm asking for too much, and I kind of get that sense as well, but this is, this is what Season 1 is. It's a lot of content, right? Um, for gameplay, for this story coverage, there's a lot of fun things we can do. I want a strike mission on Scarlet Briar. She makes the most sense to me. Scarlet Briar strike would be awesome. Up there on the Bre Breach Maker. I see an opportunity for two Dragonstorm style instances this time. We already have the marionette in game, so they just point to it. Brilliant, done. But I think they could do the evacuation is one of them. And the reclamation of the city. These were actually two very distinct patches with massive meta events. And, you know, cutscenes and things. So they could actually be separate. You could do just one big Dragonstorm instance where they're all folded in together. But I think that these could be separate. You could do two of them. And finally, what do we do for the new map? Now, guys. We're talking about bringing Season 1 back. For what purpose? To make Guild Wars feel complete. To stop people whining about the missing part of the game. You know what people also whine about? What everyone wants back? What people have a grudge at the studio for? That they just can't get over? Lion's Arch. The new map could be old LA, alright? Think about it. Hold on, think about it. If we're doing an evacuation phase of the city, that is old LA, right? Um, back when old LA got replaced with new LA, the devs had this idea. They didn't they hadn't settled on this idea that maps were frozen in time yet. We now 
appreciate the game works that way, okay? So this would be totally in line with the spirit of bringing back old content, right? You basically give players the choice which Lion's Arch they want to visit when they waypoint there through the world map, right? I, I think it's totally doable. It's kind of a little bit hard to visualize, but I think it's totally doable. And then what you also have, okay, wait, 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 what else is clunky about Guild Wars at the moment for a new player? When they log in and they're playing the personal story, they go to Lion's Arch, what happens? They're in like a weird Disneyland place, and then they go to their Starburst, and they load in, and they're back in old LA. See, here's the thing, you guys might think this is crazy, but the full map already exists in our clients. We already have old LA there in Guild Wars 2 today in 2022. We visit it when we're playing the personal story, but they, you know, it's not it's not an open world version of it. It's not, you know, it, it's it's sort of caged off, isn't it? And you can't explore the whole place. And all the NPCs aren't there. And sometimes it's under attack by the Risen and stuff because it's the personal story. But the map is there. All the data is there. So what I'm saying is for a new player who's playing through the personal story, when they first visit Lion's Arch, if they haven't beaten Season 1 yet, essentially, if that character hasn't been flagged to have beaten Season 1 yet, they're still in old LA as an open world map like normal. None of that weird clunkiness is there, none of the need for the sepia tone or anything like that. But when they beat Season 1, it instead flips to new Lion's Arch, or hell, even destroyed Lion's Arch if you like, and then after Season 2 starts, it's new. Actually, technically, isn't it the end of Season 2 that it becomes New Lion's Arch? But basically, if players want at this point, they can choose through the UI which version of LA they want to visit. But it is there in the open world for people who want to return to that. That cohesiveness and, and comfort of season of playing the personal story as a new player makes sense. Because that's another big clunky thing, totally in line with what the whole update's about. Now, what were the arguments for not doing it back in the day? Well, first of all, they hadn't come across this idea of the maps frozen in time thing, right? But also, I think back when original Lion's Arch was destroyed and became Disneyland Lion's Arch, ArenaNet were really scared of spreading the player base out too much. But at this point in Guild Wars, that doesn't matter anymore. There are so many maps so spread out all over the place and with the low player caps from End of Dragons and stuff that clearly it does it's not a priority it's something that they can't fix anymore and in fact I think they know that because what did we see after this all happened what did we see start happening during season two and especially through the Heart of Thorns era lobbies people are already split into a million cities they're split into their guild halls uh, sometimes they're split into Arborstone they're split into the Eye of the North they're split into the, the other existing cities they're split into the fractal lobby they're split onto the airship in Gendaran they're split into the Lava Lounge. They're already split all over the place, okay? So that is already out, out the window. So what would be the harm in giving us access to a map that's already in the client so that now people, even back in the personal story, have a proper coherent thing. And yeah, when you beat season one, have it turn into the destroyed Lion's Arch. When you, uh, or, or, you know, straight into Disneyland, if you like. You don't need to support three versions. I think this would be really cool. And I think an announcement of season one with old LA coming back, it's all perfectly the kind of thing that people who missed this old content would really like to hear. And, um, and in fact, let me just say this. I think it would be a great move at the start of the season, even. Because if you think about it, really, the whole way through these three episodes, we would like to be in old LA. The Karka attack should be in old LA. Like, I glossed over this a second ago. How many of you guys picked up on this, this, this fact? But if we're doing episode one, and we're starting with a consortium in Lion's Arch Karka attack, that's going to be old LA. That's not Disneyland LA getting attacked. So they could do it personal story style, or they could go the whole hog and just straight up bring back Lion's Arch, old Lion's Arch. I appreciate the one little flimsy thing I've got here is I haven't quite figured out how you would pick the map. If you're a player that wants to be in Disneyland, or if you're a, the player that wants to be in the old one. Um, but I really like this idea, how it would look when you press M, for example. I think it's a good idea, and I think even End of Dragons proved they can do sophisticated stuff like this. Like how when we load into Xingji, that one moment in the End of Dragons story, you're actually not in Xingji, you're in a totally other area, and it's like really creepy and weird. They could do stuff like that, I really think they can. So, uh, <laughs> I kind of came up on this idea as I was thinking about Season uh, 1 re-implementation. And I just thought this would be brilliant, wouldn't it? I don't know. There you go, guys. Am I crazy? Who knows? This is another hour-long PowerPoint. I'm going to ease off on these because I don't know if people are bored by it or I'm sort of uh, being a bit presumptive and a bit silly. You know, I know people want me to just talk about lore and stuff, so um, we'll see. But there you go, guys. Thank you very much for watching. I would love to hear what you think about all of this. And in particular as well, let's loop back to the start. What would you rather now? Season 1, Super Adventure Box... 
or season six. I might actually throw that poll out. Keep an eye out on my Twitter. Keep an eye out on my YouTube channel. Once you've watched this, I want to hear people's opinions. I want to see walls of text down below. I'll be reading them all. And we could do a follow-up Q&A video as well if we like as well. If people feel that's warranted. Um, I'm nervous about this video because I think people are just going to be like very, very negative about it. But hey, I believe in it. I'm passionate about it. We'll see. So thanks very much for watching, guys. See you next time. Oh, and a reminder, if you've liked the footage in the corner for this video and you are interested in Season 1, definitely check out this link that you can see there. It's my recap of the whole story of Season 1, sort of retold. It was created very recently, so it wasn't me actually playing it, but it is the whole story abridged and more concise than some of the other recaps that are out there, which go on hours and hours and hours. That one's just one.